Today on Wallbook, we're headed to good old San Antonio, Texas and visiting with wildlife biologist Macy Ledbetter to find out why the biggest bucks are killed during the worst droughts. It has been one of those years in Texas and beyond. From the cool and cozy JW Marriott, I'm Carlos with Wallbuck. Let's jump right in. As ironic as this sounds, why are the biggest bucks killed during the worst droughts? That's a great question, Carlos. Thank you for having me here. And you're right, we're indoors in the air condition. This is the right place to be at the right time. August in uh, South Texas is never uh, fun to be outdoors. So I pity the wildlife. They are struggling, as we talked about. And, and ironically, as your question, you know, it, it doesn't sound like it should happen the way it does, but you're exactly right. And, and the short answer to the question is how or why does that happen is all of these plants that the deer browse on, the browse plants, particularly in South Texas, are very, very high in nutrition, anywhere from say 14 to 35% crude protein. And so when, when rainfall is abundant and plentiful, the, the plants concentrate more on growing and that's a whole lot different than the building nutrition and that kind of stuff. So you have, you know, during the wet times you have to mow your grass often because it grows so fast. It doesn't mean it's nutritious. So during drier times, the plant slows down from lack of water. It slows down its growth, but more of the nutrients are, com uh, are combined, if you would, are concentrated in the remaining leaves. So in other words, a deer gets more nutrition, kind of a, a action-packed nutritional pack in a smaller leaf because the plant is not worrying itself and producing so much growth. So there's smaller leaves, there's less canopy, but they're more nutrient-packed, more nutrient-rich. To be more precise, uh, if these bucks aren't eating Forbes browse and other native vegetation because it isn't available, or what are they eating that's helping them grow so big? You're right, Forbes are the, uh, what they call the ice cream plant, and when it's raining, there's Forbes. When it's not, there's no Forbes there, and the grass quits growing, and the brush slows down. So once the browse plants are gone, or as they are declining, you'll notice a lot of times on bare ground, you'll see what's called moss or lichens or even algae. You'll see deer, it looks like they're eating bare dirt, and honestly, they're eating that film, that small film on top of the dirt very very rich in, in vitamins and m micro and macro nutrients so sometimes you'll see a deer uh, with dirt on his nose and he's licking his nose and licking his lips and even eating dirt because he's eating the lichens within the dirt so they eat the browse plants but they're also eating the uh, the lichens and the uh, uh, protozoans and all that stuff on a microscopic le microscopic level now I have seen and heard that deer do go to the extent of eating prickly pear cactus. Um, can you maybe talk about that and is, do they really do that? Yes sir, they really do. When you see a white-tailed deer eating prickly pear cactus, that is a self-defense mode. Uh, they're, they're hurting, you know, they're, the, the, the little bitty thorns that get in our hands and fingers and drive us crazy, the saliva dissolves those. So they can eat that small stuff very, very easily with no harm. They do have to avoid the large thorns, but a prickly pear obviously is full of water, even during a the drought. They, it's a great water reservoir, if you would, stores a lot of water. But uh, prickly pear has a real high concentration of uh, carbohydrates and starches. So it'd be like uh, you and I eating a Snickers bar. Not a whole lot of nutrition to it, but there's a whole lot of sugar and carbohydrates. Kind of picks you up, kind of gives you a boost for the day. As landowners and hunters in a year like the one we are having, what measures can we take to alleviate the natural disaster deer and wildlife are enduring? You know, this is the challenge that Mother Nature throws at us. You know, anybody can grow uh, bountiful wildlife when it rains. That makes it really, really easy. But in a hard time like this, that's where the uh, deer managers have to step up. And, and what that means is you plan ahead, you plan accordingly. So uh, from a uh, deer management perspective, you always hear uh, density and stocking rate should be conservative. It should be conservative because of times like this. So if you're overstocked, your animals are going to suffer. Uh, suffer. If you're overstocked, your uh, habitat is going to suffer. So if you see either sign of that this year, this hunting season, then regardless of your density, you may have too many animals on the range. So this discussion that we're having uh, here today kind of once again reinforces the importance of supplemental feeding, which is something you and I have discussed at length before. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Supplemental feeding is just what it says. It supplements the animal's dietary needs in times like this. So when it rains a lot and everything's lush and green, people that feed realize that they don't spend much money and time on feed because the deer don't want it or need it. But now that the feed's available, the animals will hit it hard. So right now, most landowners are complaining to me that their feed bills are going up because the, the native nutrition is going down. So the, uh, the protein pellets of today are very well done, very well designed. They're pretty much a complete feed. They have all the micro and macronutrients in it. So we're still gonna grow some giant deer this year, not only because of the plants that get more concentrated, but the deer are eating more protein. Even the younger deer are eating more protein at an earlier age. So the antlers, I expect the antlers this year, this fall to be outstanding, even though we're in a drought. Given the fact it's been a rough year overall for wild pasture deer, would you suggest landowners harvest less deer this season than they would on a good bountiful year? No, in fact, it would be just opposite. First, I would spend an enormous effort on surveying, you know, maybe more twice as uh, survey effort as you've done in the past. If you've only done spotlight surveys, then this year maybe consider a, a helicopter survey in addition to maybe consider more herd composition, daylight observations. But it's really, really important because we, we know the animals are suffering, we know the habitat's suffering. So it's really important that we inventory our herd, our bucks, does, and fawns, and then harvest aggressively. Again, when you harvest an animal, you wanna pull the hide off and see if there's any fat reserves left particularly around the tail head. The tail head is right there where the tail meets the rump. That's the last place they put fat reserves on their body and it's the first place they take it off. So as you harvest deer throughout the season, you wanna watch that, that development of tail head fat. And if it's already gone at the beginning of the season, then you have too many animals, regardless of what your density has, uh, says. So do a, do a survey, do aggressive surveys to establish you know, your herd composition, and then probably increase your harvest rate over what you've done the last couple of years, because your 800 acres doesn't have the same carrying capacity this year as it had last year. So you should be carrying fewer animals now to keep those fewer animals more healthy. So during times of drought, and of backing off the animal harvest, you should increase your animal harvest. Macy Ledbetter, thank you so much for having a drink with us here <laughs> at you. the Texas Deer Association. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. There you have it. Why the biggest bucks are killed during the worst droughts. Straight from biologist Macy Ledbetter. Visit Macy at springcreekoutdoors.com and Spring Creek Outdoors on Facebook. A big thank you to Old Mexico Hunting Resorts for the bar and booth hospitality, Butch Ramirez Wildlife Photography, Boxy Kalina Wildlife Photography, The Holden Pasture, and Texas Buck Registry. If you learned something from this episode, like, comment, and share it with someone interested in wildlife preservation.